Right, hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you from a somewhat cloudy San Diego this morning. But today I'm delighted to be joined from Toronto in Canada by Thais Gibson. How are you doing, Thais? I'm doing wonderful. Very happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. And Thais is the best-selling author of the book, Attachment Theory, A Guide to Strengthening the Relationships in Your Life. And what we're going to talk about today is the necessity of engaging your subconscious mind in order to create success, overcome procrastination, and ban self-sabotage for good. And Thais uh, runs the Personal Development School. So anything you hear today, uh, you can actually go and learn more about it and actually uh, enroll in some courses that help you with it. So in order to avoid any more procrastination here, we'll get straight into it. <laughs> so, so Thais, tell me about, so, so subconscious mind, um, what, does that, what does that mean in practice? Because I know everybody knows kind of what your subconscious mind is, but the idea of engaging it, I don't think a lot of people would really understand what that really means in practice. Absolutely. So one of the biggest things I see, and it's such a great analogy for this, is when people set New Year's resolutions. I think the statistic is something like 97% of people fail their New Year's resolution by day three. And it's like, come on, like there has to be something going on there. Mm -hmm. And what happens, what we don't recognize all the time is that your conscious mind can set a goal or an intention, but unless your subconscious mind is on board and aligned with that, your subconscious mind cannot be outwilled or overpowered by your conscious mind. And this is like the source of what we experience as self-sabotage of our new year's resolutions our goals our procrastination is literally that our conscious and subconscious are actually working against each other mm -hmm. and so what we have to be able to do is understand what needs are being met from this experience when we sabotage or procrastinate and start to actually work to reprogram whatever patterns so that our conscious and subconscious can come together instead of having this friction of basically working apart. So I'll, I'll share a quick example of this. I, I was speaking to somebody once and their subconscious needs were very much related to security, comfort, family, and social. And their conscious goal for, for their new year's resolutions was to go to the gym and eat healthy and or healthily and and this person of course right what does their subconscious mind perceive about that goal it's like well going to the gym is going to take me out of my comfort zone away from security it's going to take time away from family and social time so of course the subconscious mind is always going to win the conscious is going to go let's go in this direction the subconscious can be like mm, we have other priorities and so what we have to do is start linking these things together how can we go to the gym with friends with family how can we exercise in a way that makes us feel safe and comfortable and when we can understand the framework of our subconscious and bring these things together we can hack any goal Right. Yeah, because it always seems like that people often do, uh, you know, like you said, resolutions, whatever. But even sometimes when people say things to you, you can see they're saying it, but you can also almost see in their face that they're not really on board with it or they're not comfortable with it. It's like when you ask somebody to do something, you know, something and they say, yeah, absolutely. But you're looking at them going, you don't want to do this, do you? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And what we don't realize is your conscious mind is responsible for roughly like three to 5% of, of your mm -hmm. feelings, your actions, your behaviors, and your subconscious 95 to 97%. So mm -hmm. if we don't get our subconscious on board, it literally becomes next to impossible to create lasting change or to show up for a goal in a lasting way. Mm -hmm. So part of it is obviously, as you just said, is part of it is to make yourself accountable, you know, and that's obviously when you surround yourself with people, you know, you kind of, you put it out there and you make yourself accountable, right? And that's, and that's, yeah. that's a good step. Yeah, absolutely. But really like the, the framework that you can use to discover your subconscious programs are to find what's already showing up in your behavior. So you can ask yourself a set of questions, things like, what do I naturally talk to people about? What am I always thinking about? What am I inspired to do? What, what do I show up for that nobody has to twist my arm to get there? Right. And, and these things that are naturally already in your behavior, if you could act as the observer of your life, those are going to be the things that are your subconscious needs. And once you have the framework of like what my subconscious keeps going to, what it's always needing and, and emotionally invested in naturally. And for some people, that's their relationships in their life. For some people, that's their personal growth. For some people, that is their business and their finances. So once we can observe that, then all we have to do is we practice linking. So we just take whatever conscious goals we have and we try to link them 
them to these things that our subconscious is already naturally inspired by. And that's like one of the major ways we can hack goal setting, hack our subconscious mind and become way more productive in an effortless way as a result. So, so that's excellent. So the, but the first thing is to do is to figure out what those things are. But as you said, those things that you naturally can do without even asking yourself, right? Things that you look forward to doing that you're excited about doing. Exactly. <laughs> Absolutely. And I, I often say to people, like, there's no, we think, oh, self-sabotage. There's really no such thing as self-sabotage. Every self-sabotage is just a subconscious strategy to get different needs met than the ones we're trying to get met at a conscious level. Yeah. So what are the, so what are some of those, as you said, like you're getting different needs met. So when you are always, as you said, like setting goals, but not achieving them or you're procrastinating or, or you're doing other, what, that is, as you said, that's meeting a need of, of some kind. That's a different need than the one to achieve the goal. What, what, what are some of those needs and how do you identify them? Yeah, it's a great question. So one thing you want to be aware of is that the brain is like a needs meeting machine. Every single decision we make is to get some kind of need met. And this includes like you yelled at your wife or, or, you know, like everything is for some kind of need. It could be to, to get hurt, to set a boundary, to get seen, to take your power back. Like every single thing we do is based on meeting a need. So what we can start asking ourselves to familiarize ourselves with our needs is like, when I do these repetitive patterns of behavior, that thing I'm always doing, the, the goal I'm always sabotaging, you know, I go home and eat chocolate instead of going mm -hmm. to the gym or whatever it is, like what needs are those trying to meet? And by becoming the observer of that, you'll start to recognize patterns. And those patterns are literally going to be related to your six basic human needs. So mm -hmm. there's about 45 major needs we could go through, but I won't go through all of them <laughs> right now. But the six basic human needs are based on Tony Robbins research. And, and, and these are growth, certainty, uncertainty, AKA novelty, exploration, adventure, mm -hmm. these sorts of things, significance, contribution, love, and connection. Right. And basically everything we do is trying to get back into those things in some form or another. And when we can start to recognize like the hierarchy of that, cause we all have all of these needs, but like which ones drive you, what are your top one or two? And once you know that, the more you can link to those things, like anything you want to do, let's say I want to start a business and let's pretend like I have a huge need for growth, but let's pretend it's for my highest need is love and connection. If I can link how starting a business is going to help my family, mm -hmm. my children, my relationships, my, my partner, whatever it is, then I'm naturally going to feel really inspired and aligned. And this is like how we have to hack our subconscious mind. <laughs> yeah, it's a great point because I do think that oftentimes we do things without, without understanding why we're doing it. And uh, yeah, as you say, maybe you would start a business and say, well, I want to start a business because maybe I want to work for myself and maybe I, I hope that the business will take off and then I can be financially secure and all that. But you haven't actually gone to the, what you just talked about. Uh, and then when things get tough, you don't have anything to sustain. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that people like try to build their why. We hear a lot of like psychology talk mm. around building your why. And that's useful because the, the mm. reason for this is that the subconscious mind, its language is the language of emotion, emotion and symbols. So it doesn't speak like the language of words really. Mm. So it's useful, but, but sometimes we do this thing where we're like, we're going to build our why and we don't get to the root of it. We go, Oh, I want to start a business. because I want to make money. But mm. for some people making money is because it makes them feel significant and secure, right? They get right. those basic human needs met for significance and safety for somebody else it's like, oh, you know, I want to make money because I like the feeling of growth and growing financially. Mm -hmm. So if we don't know our deepest roots of our why, we're still limited in our ability to create and drive our own motivation as unique individuals. Yeah. And I would also say that uh, for most people, and this is something that I, I, I've talked about before is, is come up in other conversations is that, you know, okay, so maybe starting a business, you know, there's a lot of thinking and thought that goes into that. But your everyday, for people who aren't starting business, people who are just doing their, their job or their homemaker or whatever they're doing, um, I think very few people stop to ask themselves why they're doing it, what is their motivation, and as you say, what needs are being met by this. So, there's, so there's, there's often this kind of latent or not so latent frustration because they've never really looked at what they're doing, where they're going, why they're doing it. 100%. And something I say to people all the time is like, unless you know your personality needs, like what your personality is driven by, motivated by, you don't create a really clear vision of what you want in your life. And then we have also a really difficult time knowing what to say no to. 
right? It's like, mm-hmm. if I don't know that, you know, I have a certain degree of need for love and connection from friends and family or, you know, desire to grow as a human being, then I don't, I say yes to, you know, moving my neighbor's house. And, and I say yes to all these things that are actually keeping me uninspired, not getting my buckets filled of those six basic human needs. And then I start operating on kind of an empty. And then that mm-hmm. shows up in my internal dialogue and in my general emotions throughout the course of the day. Maybe I feel depleted. So many people sit at their desk, they're exhausted. They don't know why. Usually people are less exhausted because they're doing so much of something. And usually they're more exhausted because they're not getting enough of something they really need. Yeah, and then obviously uh, resentment can start to come in, right? Oh, yeah. uh, and and that and obviously resentment then is a, is just a fantastic way of just depleting everything and just putting you in a very negative headspace, <laughs> right? I couldn't agree more. And you you touch on such a powerful thing. What resentment actually is is it's literally unmet needs plus a lack mm-hmm. of communication. Right. And so wherever we don't know our needs, obviously we're disempowered to actually get them met. Wherever we don't get our needs met, we're obviously disempowered to be motivated and inspired and resentment naturally flows out of that as a result. So we start by communicating to ourselves and discovering our own drivers at that deep subconscious level and that starts to open up everything else. Yeah, and it's funny because, I mean, I think that, uh, you know, that idea of like figuring out what your own needs are, that's something that's not really taught to us, is it? I mean, it's just something, I mean, it almost sounds like some people would say, oh, you know, that's very self-indulgent. Um, you know, you should be thinking about how you can help everybody else, right? But the reality is, unless you know your own drivers, then you can't really help anybody else. And I, I love that you raised that point because I can't tell you how many people I see just sacrificing themselves, not having boundaries. And then this bleeds into everything else. And when we are unfulfilled as people, we start acting out of desperation. And this is where like the quote unquote, like ugliest things happen where, you know, you haven't had your needs met for so long. So you go to, you have some kind of manipulative strategy to get them met. Cause you don't think you can ask for them or you have this roundabout way of trying to get them met that is secretive and, you know, just doesn't show up well in your relationship. So we, it, the, one of the most important things we can do for ourselves and for others is fill our cups, get clear about what our cup needs to be filled with, have those conversations with people around us. And when we're in the highest expression of ourselves, like people who are happy, it aren't hurting other people. People who are fulfilled mm-hmm. are not out yeah. there hurting other people. It's the people who are depleted, who are in a space of lack, who are not feeling good about themselves in their lives that hurt people, hurt people. And so literally one of the most important things we can do for ourselves in relationships is get in touch with that stuff within ourselves. And even people who are in a space where they're like giving so much to others and being sacrificial and selfless, sometimes really, because every single thing we do is to get a need met. Sometimes those people are actually behaving that way as a subconscious strategy to get their need met for significance. Mm -hmm. to feel important people need me you know so so sometimes we're still doing those things but instead of having these direct strategies and open transparent communication with people around us we have these covert things we do to get our needs met that that have a much greater downside yeah no it's true i mean there's there's so much in that it's funny the last part it's like those people it's like when you see somebody does something that you know it's pretty nice and kind but they post it on facebook for everyone to see and then you wonder like (laughs) Hmm. Is it, isn't it just good that you did it? Do you need to like advertise the fact? But also, as you said, I mean, when your needs, when you don't understand your needs or your needs aren't getting met or whatever, this is where you can, you know, for some people, unfortunately, you can spiral into very negative behaviors like addiction and other things or, um, you know, really, you know, dysfunctional relationships. And I mean, there's, there's a kind of snowball effect, isn't there? And like, I always say to people, you can only give what you actually have. And I've Mm -hmm. lived on both sides of that as a human being. I understand that Mm -hmm. so deeply. And like, what is required for us to show up well is for us to be fulfilled. Like the more we, you don't see somebody who's truly happy and fulfilled out there, you know, angry, yelling at people on the sidewalk. Mm -hmm. Like we we don't see people who are feeling really good doing stuff like that because we don't want to sacrifice that. But we've been taught and conditioned so much as a society that, oh, don't speak up, don't don't share your needs. Don't be vulnerable. Don't express emotion. Don't, you know, don't show up in your truth. And literally that is creating so many different challenges and problems that we see. And just like you touched on with addiction, most people who I see with addiction, depression, Mm -hmm. anxiety, emotional struggles, almost every single one of those people has formed some belief pattern somewhere along the way that says, I can't ask for my needs. It's bad to ask for my needs. People won't meet them anyways. Why bother? There's no point. And so they're in a state of like, 
pervasive disempowerment of what they want and giving themselves permission to get clear and show up for themselves because they are actively repressing their inner part of their truth. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's so powerful. And, and I think today as well is, you know, with what's going on in the world, uh, it, there's, there's a great temptation to feel that all this is happening to me, right? This is all happening to me and I have no, and there's nothing I can do about it. And it's very easy to like feel disempowered or, or, you know, to feel sorry for yourself. Absolutely. And I think one of the things that we have to do as human beings is it's like, I give people this analogy sometimes, like if you, not, let's not say you, let's say Bob down the street, yeah. <laughs> if Bob gets diagnosed with cancer, mm-hmm. you know, Bob should not be sitting there going, oh my gosh, why me? You know, and telling these painful stories because those stories create emotional responses made up of neurochemistry that are just going to further mm-hmm. tax the system, right? And, and interrupt healthy patterns in his physiology. So, so what Bob really needs to do is be like, I need to focus all my energy on being for a solution Mm -hmm. instead of feeling victimized by the problem. And the more serious the situation is, the more he needs to do that because it's critical. And I think we sort of have to apply that analogy to our our everyday lives right now, because there's so much going on in the world. And the more intense the situations and challenges are, the less bandwidth we can really afford Mm -hmm. to give to thinking about being fighting, you know, fighting against the problem. And instead we have to use our, the real estate in our brain to go, okay, how can we be for a solution? What do we need in times like this? Let's start coming up with creative solutions. Love and connection. Yes. is missing a lot because there's less, there's more mm-hmm. isolation, less human contact. Great. What are some creative strategies to get more love and connection? I better start booking video chats on the weekend mm-hmm. and I better start having more vulnerable conversations with my loved ones. Like we have to get creative in these ways and own and acknowledge our needs. Otherwise we're just going to feel like we're spinning our wheels and we're, you know, collectively disempowered. Yeah. And I, and I think that's, and I, and I think that's so powerful as well, because, um, because right now, um, I think you have to focus on what's in front of you because we get we get dragged into this idea. You know, we start to have these conversations of like huge global issues and get angry about all these things that we can't really impact. What we can impact, as you said, is we can impact ourselves and then we can impact those around us. And if we if we take that as a starting point and if everybody took that as a starting point, it all collectively comes together. I love that. And I couldn't agree more. I say, I say this to people a lot. I'll say like, you know, there's not going to be a superhero who flies in and Mm. like saves everybody. Like how collective change happens is each unique individual taking accountability for their lives, for Mm. how they want to show up. And then if everybody does that, or a lot more people do that, Mm. that creates a tipping point where collective shifts start to take place. Yeah. And the other thing too, is what I tried to say to people is that you can, you can, you can tell people what they should do. You can share to people, you can, whatever. Um, Generally speaking, that's not, uh, it's anybody's had children. That's not a particularly uh, effective strategy. You can shout to them and tell them what to do. Modeling behavior is what actually makes the difference at the end. And I think that's what we need more of today is, as you said, if people, if people really figure themselves out and become positive, then other people will notice. I mean, I guess that's the thing that when you've worked with people, um, I bet you it's other people suddenly notice the change and go, I want to be like that rather than somebody saying, oh, I just did some self-development and here's what you need to do with yourself. <laughs> <laughs> so I couldn't agree more at that point as well because here's what happens the subconscious mind actually gets programmed through three major ways what we hear repetitively what's modeled to us and then what we have firsthand experiences of and so when you're trying to force feed somebody to have firsthand experiences it usually doesn't work well and usually there's just resistance and people feel like they personalize that oh you think i'm not good enough you think i'm and then all these core wounds come up from that but what we can do is what we model to people and what we say repetitively from our space those are, that's, you know, two out of three things that are going to program somebody else and other people's behaviors around us more than the third one. And so it's mm-hmm. really important to dive into that and, and to lead from that space. I think that's true leadership as well. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I, and I think that's what, that's what people need to think more about. Like, you know, how can I work on myself and then how can I model positive behaviors and that therefore, and influence people influence people that way so um uh, before we finish right if somebody was if somebody's listening to this and they say okay how do i how do i start where do i start because i think that's always uh, people would say yeah this is something i need to do and then the procrastination sets in or just the the fear or i don't know where i don't know where to start and and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a little flustered by that so i'll just do nothing 
<laughs> and this is what happens. The brain projects negative feelings onto things and then it's wired to avoid pain. So it goes, oh, that mm -hmm. feels overwhelming. I don't know where to start. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm just going to avoid that feeling of overwhelm and move away from, mm -hmm. from the thing. So, so it's an excellent question. So here's what you can do. Number one, you need to understand the landscape of your subconscious mind. And you know, there's so much we could say about that, but like to really get specific, let's get clear on your, your six basic human needs and the order and hierarchy. So you develop a first framework of what's driving you. So what you want to do is list these things from one to six on a piece of paper. And I'll just say them quickly again, growth, um, significance, contribution, certainty, uncertainty, AKA novelty, and love and connection. And then go through and write out and contribution is in there. I, I, I might've said one twice, but, but put mm -hmm. them through and label like actually go and write out okay what's number one two three four five six for me and pick the focus on your top two and then pause that put that there step two go into like what is my vision what am i trying to create what is my goal a lot of times people have like an idea but they're not clear and intentional enough and so that can create a feeling of overwhelm as well so we really need absolute clarity absolute intentionality and then what you want to do is make a list of 20 or 30 ways that this goal that you're really clear about is going to benefit those top two needs that drive you and try mm -hmm. to link them as much as possible. So if it's, you know, like the, the example of the client I was speaking about, she's like, I need to go to the gym and eat healthily. Great. Love and connection and, and safety, security were really driving her certainty. So she needed to link those things together as much as possible and create strategies to bring them together. Like exercise at home where I feel super safe in, in comfortable mm -hmm. workout clothes alone. Like you know, these sorts of things, or go to the gym with people, friends, and family, love and connection. So the more we can drive these things in here and link them, naturally, you're going to feel inspired. It's not going to feel like you have to push yourself. It's going to feel mm -hmm. effortless and excited, and you're making those plans. And so those would be, a, you know, the first three steps of a really fantastic place to start. And the subconscious mind is, is programmed through repetition plus emotion. So the more you can link repetitively and remind yourself repetitively because it elicits an emotional reaction, the more that's going to imprint your subconscious and become a natural part of your programming and the way you see and interact with the world. Yeah, no, I think that's that's so fantastic. And all, all of the Thais information will be in our contributor bio so you can find out more. Um, you also have, I noticed on your personal development school site, you have an attachment status the attachment style quiz that people can take. So that's a nice, interesting way to start. But please do, before we go, tell people a little bit more about you and what you do. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I um, actually came from my own personal struggles. I had a background experience of, of addiction. When I learned about the subconscious mind, I learned why it was so hard to get sober. It was because mm -hmm. I was consciously intending and subconsciously I had other desires to escape pain and old things I had to process. And so that was a really profound sort of healing journey for me. So I ended up going back to school, doing a master's degree in transpersonal psych, doing like 13 different certifications. And from that, um, ran a really busy client practice for a few years, realized I was trading a lot of time for, for money and, and, you know, I wasn't able to scale. And so I ended up putting an online school together and we have um, just under 2000 current students and um, lots of people in there. I have a lot of free content on YouTube. And if you do the attachment style quiz on the website, through there, you actually get like a one page report about some of your personality qualities, your needs, like it does a deep dive into that. Um, so it's a great place to sort of gather a little bit more information too. Excellent. I think I'll do it myself, actually. This is always fun to, to learn. We, we awesome. can never stop learning about ourselves, can we? I couldn't agree more. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, this, is, this, is Thais. this has been fantastic. My name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine, Pipeliner CRM. See you all for another expert interview really soon. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Have a wonderful day.